Okay. All right. We're going to go on and get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight. My name is Beth Bond, um, rabble rouser in DeKalb County. Yes, right? Curator of Sustainable News at Southeast Green, which is the largest online news site for uh, sustainable business and environmental policy. And I have a podcast called Speaking of Green. But my most important role here tonight is as a board member of Georgia Interfaith Power and Light and um, step down rabble rouser of the creation care team, but uh, leadership is still on the creation care team um, here at Decatur First. Ann Blair is our co-chair, and they give everybody a wave um, for creation care. And then of course, Holy uh, Trinity Episcopal is the other creation care team that is co-hosting this event with us tonight. So um, let me just confess, I've been a little selfish. So uh, Paul Hawken, who is the, 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 the creator of this conversation and the book that we're going to discuss and the movement, um, and he was here in April, but it was right before the climate march, and I was going to D.C. and felt very sad when I found out that I had missed him, and everybody was talking about what a great event it was. And we are so blessed and honored to have two of the people who are directly involved in the project in Atlanta. And I was like, well, we'll just do it again. We won't have Paul Hawkins, but we'll, we'll have two of the, cre you know, two of the uh, organizers with us, and they're here in Atlanta, so why not do it again? So thank you all so very much for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then Catherine uh, Wilkinson, who is, sorry, Dr. Catherine Wilkinson, who is um, the senior writer for the project, is going to do like a 10-minute quick review, and then we'll get into the questions. And by the way, it was very, very important to me that we have conversation and dialogue. This is big stuff and big ideas, and so we have reserved 30 minutes. Um, and since I have the key to the church, if we need to go longer and people have got time, we'll talk a bit longer. Does that sound good? All right, good. Here we go. We still got people pouring in. Yay! Um, so our first panelist, um, and she'll be very recognizable, I think, out of the three panelists we have, uh, Dr. Catherine Wilkinson is the senior writer, writer at Project Drawdown, focused on bringing the book Drawdown to life and to the world. Her interdisciplinary background cuts across sustainability, strategy, and thought leadership. Previously, Catherine was director of strategy at Bright House. Based on her doctoral research at Oxford, Catherine published Between God and Green, How Evangelicals Are Cultivating a Middle Ground on Climate Change, called a, vi a vitally important, even subversive story by the Boston Globe. She holds a doctorate in philosophy and geography and environment from Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar, and a BA in religion from Swanee, the University of the South, where she was a Udall Scholar and a valedictorian. Now, John, you're going to have to raise your hand. So people know. This is John Lanier, okay? He is the exec direct, executive director of the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, a private family foundation caring for the legacy of its namesake by supporting environmental sustainability initiatives. In 1973, Ray Anderson founded Interface Carpet, which became the world's largest carpet tile manufacturer. From 1994 until his passing in 2011, Ray worked tirelessly to advance sustainability at his company and in the business sector generally. John, one of Ray's five grandchildren, shares his late grandfather's passion for the earth and his natural systems. John lives in Atlanta with his wife and young son and is an attorney by training. And our third panelist, Jim Hartsfeld, um, is also, just so you know, a co-board co member with me. Um, he is the principal of Hartsfeld Sustainability Advisors. He's leveraging 18 plus years working on sustainability with Ray C. Anderson and Interface. Jim helps organizations build on their efforts in environmental sustainability to embrace human technologies of innovation, collaboration, and learning that they that they are necessary to accelerate progress and growth. In 1994, as a chemical engineer and MBA, Jim was championed, had championed sustainable enterprise as the right and smart thing to do through a wide range of roles that interface with organizations such as the U.S. Green Building Council, two-term chairman, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the President's Council on Sustainable Development, and now a special advisor to the UN Global Compact. Jim led interface sustainability and consulting arm, supporting over 41 Fortune 1000 companies on their own sustainability initiatives across a wide range of business sectors. Jim serves on the board of Georgia Interfaith Power and Light and the founding board of a new nonprofit, Conscious Capitalism of Metro Atlanta. Let's welcome our panelists.
And we're in church. Can I get an amen? All right. Okay, so the subtitle of this book, Drawdown, is The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming. So I'm going to try and zip us through that in about eight minutes, which should be, I think, doable. Um, just so I have a sense of the room, um, who has put their paws on the book, flipped through the pages? Awesome. Okay. And, uh, and the website? Anybody browsed around the website? It's really good, John. I'm glad you've done that. <laughs> um, great. So the, uh, the dominant sort of storyline about climate change goes something like this. It's bad. It's going to get very bad. We're headed towards an unlivable planet. We're totally ill-equipped to reverse course as a species. There's some slim hope that maybe we'll figure it out. Please change your light bulbs, recycle your Coke cans, and also cross your fingers. Uh, I don't know about you all, but that's a storyline um, that tends to result in fear, apathy, shame, guilt, paralysis, depression, you name it. Um, a, a whole bunch of things that are not helpful foundations for action. And I think there's also been a, a real lack of clarity about what that action should even be, right? The magnitude of this problem against solutions like changing our light bulbs and recycling Coke cans, like something feels profoundly out of step um, in, in all of that. And implicit in, I think, the story that I will certainly implicate myself in, in telling as part of the climate movement, um, the subtext is that human beings are terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, greedy, lazy, intransigent, incompetent, and, and all the rest. And there are, fair enough, some reasons for that story, but I think we have missed the other half of the story that is really, really important um, if we're actually going to turn the tide um, on, on the conditions of our planet. And that other side of the story is, is what's in the pages of Drawdown. So there were some questions that, that plagued our founder uh, and fearless leader, Paul Hawken, for a number of years, that at the center of which was, do we actually even know what we're supposed to be doing? Do we actually even know what's in our toolbox in terms of the solutions we already have that already exist, they're proven to some degree, they're scaling, um, and if we grow those things kind of vigorously but plausibly between now and mid-century, what impact can they actually have, right? How much can each of them move the needle? And the reality was that in 40 years of climate research, those questions had gone unanswered. There was really fantastic work um, kind of looking specifically at particular solutions or particular sectors, but the aggregation of those solutions and kind of looking at the whole picture just, just hadn't been done. Um, so Paul being Paul, he was like, okay, well, I'll just start an organization and we'll do that. <laughs> and we'll write that book. Um, Drawdown, as we use the term, uh, refers to the point in time that the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere could peak and then begin to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. So that's, that's the big goal, right? Not, um, as you hear a lot, again, in kind of climate uh, discourse, not slowing emissions or stopping emissions or even stabilizing emissions at um, 400 parts per million or 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent, but actually reaching that tipping point when we head back to conditions that are most conducive for life on this planet, right? The last time uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases were this high, we weren't around. So um, probably a good idea <laughs> to, to sort of head back, uh, head back out, of, out of Terra Nova. Um, the great news is that Human beings have actually been creating this plan to get to drawdown without realizing that that's what we were doing. Um, so when this sort of small but mighty team uh, set out to do this work, we didn't have to invent a plan. We wouldn't have had um, we wouldn't have had the authority to invent a plan or come up with a plan. What we did was to, to kind of gather the collective wisdom of humanity, to draw on the incredible data and peer-reviewed research that have been done about global warming solutions, and then bring that together to both make those projections about how much impact a given solution can have and the solutions in their entirety as a system can have between now and 2050, um, and, and also then to, to, to tell it 
to tell the story, to bring it to life in a way that um, is deliberately non-textbooky, as John has said, uh, and is really accessible, hopefully evokes um, curiosity, wonder, and, um, and is, is just an enjoyable read. Um, the solutions uh, are solutions because they do one of two things. So they either avoid emissions through energy efficiency, through shifting from a more polluting technology to a clean one, um, through protecting uh, carbon dense ecosystems, and or they sequester carbon, right? They use the incredible machinery of photosynthesis to pull carbon back down um, and, and bring it home to earth. Um, so just so you know, sort of, that's, that's how you get in as a solution. You've got to tick one or both of those boxes. We've organized the solutions by sector, energy, food, buildings and cities, transport, uh, non-agricultural land use, women, girls, and materials. And then we have a section of the book that uh, is called Coming Attractions. So you can think about the, the, the core of the work as looking at solutions that are kind of trains that have already left the station, right? They're, they're on their way, they're doing their thing. Um, the coming attractions, there's not the depth of research and data uh, behind them to be able to make the projections that our research team did um, for the rest of the solutions in the book, but we're still likely to get some help from those um, over the next 30 years or so. Um, in the book, there's, uh, I'm biased, but I think some really wonderful uh, written content, um, as well as just some key results of our analysis. And then ultimately, much more of that will be available on our website. Um, hopefully by the end of the year, all of the actual models will be up and open source. So you can pop the hood and play with the assumptions and um, all, all, that, all that good jazz. And just, I wanna just kind of highlight, we're, we're gonna talk about some specific solutions up here, but I just wanted to highlight a few kind of key insights that, that come out of looking at the top 20, um, which is, you know, in the top 20, you get sort of the, the bulk of moving, of moving this needle. Um, eight of the top 20 are food, and food is the largest sector by over 100 gigatons of impact. Um, energy is five of the top 20, and a lot of times we, think about and talk about climate as really being an issue of our sources and use of energy, right? And if we figure that out, then we've, we've solved the whole thing. And that's a critical piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. Um, and I think that's a, a really important point um, and, and insight that, that comes out of this work. The number one, uh, I don't know that any of us would pick the number one as like a favorite. Um, it's profoundly unsexy. It's refrigerant management. <laughs> oh, it's geeky though. <laughs> it's geeky, it's geeky. Um, so it's all about uh, uh, HFCs, the chemical refrigerants that are in our refrigerators and air conditioners um, and the uh, more effective management and disposal of those. So kind of a surprise there certainly for us. Um, and then two of the top 10, number, solution number six and seven, are educating girls and family planning. So there's a section of the book on women and girls, which is about um, three solutions that focus on securing the, the rights, opportunities, and well-being of women and girls, and then the positive ripple effects that come out of that for the planet. So both family planning, as you can imagine, but also um, helping close the gap on girls' access to education. Both of those things end up impacting birth rates um, and thus how many feet we might have making their footprints uh, as, of, as of 2050. Um, so if you added those two together, actually the number one would be empowering women and girls. So some interesting things to, to dig around in. Um, and I've highlighted some of the top 20, but the other point of the book is that we need all of these solutions. So there is no silver bullet. Um, and, and in fact, it can sometimes feel like, oh my gosh, we have so much we have to do. And also, I hope that it feels to folks like, oh my gosh, there's so much that we can do. Um, and, and so many footholds for action and agency. And I think kind of net net, when you start to flip through these pages or you browse through our website, you start to see and hear the other side of the story, right? Which is not just that human beings are terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, but we're also creative, compassionate, collaborative, brilliant sometimes, gutsy. Um, and I think 
as, as folks who care about this issue and want to have an impact on this issue, I think we need to hear that story and tell it and own it, right? Not just about what we're doing and what we can do, but actually about who we are as human beings on the planet. So I'll leave it at that. She did a brilliant job teeing us up for the conversation, right? All right, so let's get into the conversation. That's my favorite thing. I like to have deep, meaningful conversations, and hopefully we have come up with questions that's going to guide a, a great event tonight. So we're going to start off, and um, John, why don't you start us off? What got you excited about the approach, the way that the book was written? I'll come back to that, but she is a rock star, y'all. I mean, <laughs> I know this stuff... <laughs> Pretty well. I've been a board member since the spring of uh, 2014 with Project Drawdown, uh, so I'm I'm always lit up about it. But when I hear her talk, I'm just like, yes, we can. Uh, <laughs> so the I have a bit of backstory how I came to be involved with Project Drawdown, which is relevant to the question. Uh, I had the opportunity to go and study under Paul Hawken and. Uh, so that you all know, Paul has played an important part in my life even before I met him. He's the one who wrote the book that my grandfather read that changed his life. So if Paul hadn't done that, my life looks very different. I'm not sitting up here. I was having dinner with him in the fall of 2013, and he said, oh yeah, I'm staying busy. I'm uh, teaching a class at the Presidio Graduate School, which is an MBA program out in San Francisco, uh, teaching a class called Principles of Sustainable Management. Why don't you come take my class? And I said, okay, uh, heck yeah. I turned to my mother, who's my boss, uh, one of the trustees of our foundation. And I said, are you good with me taking the time out to, to go and audit this class? They said, yes. So I went and I learned so very much about environmental sustainability generally, uh, but part of the class, we were tasked with choosing a technology that has benefits to carbon reduction and doing our best to research them and model them. And so I, uh, I, I jumped in and what I realized is how hard it is to model something like one solution. And then just imagine how hard it is to model solutions that are integrated. Because when you think about it, It'd be great if we scaled LED lights. The energy efficiency benefits of that would be tremendous. But then we're using less energy. So if we simultaneously replace coal and natural gas burning power plants with solar and wind, then the benefits from that are slightly offset by the energy efficiency savings that we had from the LED light bulbs. So how do you allocate the two of them? That's just two technologies trying to integrate. The researchers behind this, everything that has gone into this book, it has taken years because they have had to create incredibly complex models to try and give us the data. And they've done that. Are they perfect? No. No model is perfect. The question is, is it a good model? Does it give us better information than we had before? And the answer is a resounding yes. So what am I drawn to about this? It's data. It's really good data. It's finally something that we can hold on to and say, yeah, we've, we've got a plan here. Uh, this is something that can work. Awesome. Jim? OK. Um, I'm a geek at heart, trained but recovering chemical engineer, MBA. So doing the big math, obviously, you know, that, that really, really um, draw my attention. And interesting enough, that was a, a term that, that Paul used at one time for Ray and Interface early on. There's a documentary, I think, uh, So Right, So Smart, and I think, in, I think that's the documentary he mentioned. One of the things so interesting about Interface and Ray was they did the math. Well, they're doing the same thing, but on a mega scale. So the geek in me says absolutely doing the math. That, that, that drew me into it, and stunningly that nobody had really ever done that. And on the idea, is it right? No. It's not right. But another quote from Paul's from another documentary, I think, it's better to be approximately right than dead wrong. Not doing the math, it's just dead wrong, okay? But being approximately right is the other. But the other piece that, that I think could potentially be just as powerful, and Catherine mentioned it, is not only doing the big math, but, but, but 
trying to recreate the story. What's the story for who we are, how we got ourselves in this place, and flipping this around from this idea of, oh my gosh, we're all going to die, you know, game over to, as Paul would say, game on. So how do we turn this around and say, no, this is not, yes, it's a challenge, but, but how can we look at this as a gift that fundamentally gets us to reevaluate the decisions we make day in and day out, but also how we treat each other? You know, each other as people, and what are the stories we tell about who we are and what are our strengths and what can we possibly accomplish and all the great things about that future state rather than, than you know, the Armageddon kind of, kinds of stories. So that's I, you know, both, it's, it's, it's both and. It's, it's the story. Both together, I think, is exciting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, no, I, I think uh, it's, the, it's the math and, and the rigor that lets us have um, the validity to tell a different story. So I love the way those two things are sort of mutually enabling. And we know how many research institutions are out there doing good math and good modeling and you know, p putting out great analysis, and it doesn't touch the world. Um, so I think that the, the sort of marrying of those two, such a liberal arts undergraduate at heart, um, is, is so important, right? The sort of interdisciplinarity of the project. And um, I, Interface actually brought Paul and me together as well. Um, and uh, I was really excited about the project because I had asked these questions about discourse and the stories that we tell around humans and the planet and climate specifically in my PhD research and in the book that I published in 2012. And I was really excited about the opportunity not just to kind of observe that from the sidelines, but actually to be involved in, um, in, in in, in the storytelling sort of role. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna just diverge one minute. John, do you mind going over the top 10? Because I think the next questions will be more many, meaningful if people know what the top 10 are. Yeah. Do you so have them memorized? Do you wanna do it? I mean, I can, I can look at them. I think I've got them memorized, but I can't give you the numbers off the top. Can you, you, can you do the numbers? We'll, do we'll, we'll look at the numbers, it. all right. So we know the first one is refrigeration. It, it doesn't everybody want to work on that in the community, right? Doesn't that sound like fun? Woohoo! We have a lot of air conditioners. We do have a lot of air conditioners, <laughs> but I can guarantee you, um, for those of you who know me and know how many things I've gone to, I've never had to sit through a refrigeration panel. Yeah. And I'm happy about that. So, <laughs> okay. so I'll give the top 10, and then I'm going to give the numbers, but I want to give you a frame of reference first. This is approximate. If I'm wrong on this number I'm about to give, tell me. The amount of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted into the atmosphere from the combustion of all fossil fuels globally in 2016. So one year of burning the stuff that's been in the ground for millions of years was about eight and a half gigatons of carbon. Sound about right? Okay, so eight and a half is one year's worth of just fossil fuel combustion. The numbers I'm gonna give you are cumulative 2020 to 2050 added all up how much carbon dioxide equivalent is offset. Number one, refrigerant management at 89.7 gigatons. Number two, onshore wind at 84.6. And a sidebar, the reason why it's onshore and not all of wind together, offshore included, is because the economic case for scaling those two locations of wind is very different. And so they're effectively different technologies in terms of their viability for scaling. Number three, reduced food waste at 70.5 gigatons. Number four, a plant-rich diet. Does not mean vegetarian, it just means an appropriate amount, uh, a lower amount in the Western world of animal-based protein sources, 66.1. At number five, tropical forests at 61.2 gigatons. Number six and number seven are tied, that's the educating girls and family planning at 59.6 gigatons because the model couldn't effectively allocate between the two, so they came up with a total number and cut it in half. So when Catherine says that combined, they would be number one at nearly 120 gigatons, she is correct. Number eight, solar farms at 36.9 gigatons. Number nine, silva pasture at 31.9 two gigatons, and number 10, rooftop solar at 24.6 gigatons. And again, rooftop solar and solar farms are separated because the economic case for scaling both of those is very different. 
Okay, anybody else surprised? I was really surprised when I heard this list because I thought, being the solar geek I am, that solar would be number one, and it's nine and ten. So. Okay, let's go to the next question. Catherine, we'll start off with you. What is your number one personal favorite solution and why? You have to understand that these solutions were like my babies all of last year. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've probably already given you all a hint that educating girls and family planning are, are probably nearest and dearest to my heart. I really loved working on that section of the book, but since I've already said a little bit about them, maybe I will throw in um, rooftop solar, um, less because I'm such a solar geek and more because it, I think there are two pieces of uh, rooftop solar in the book that really exemplify the strengths of the book. And one is the photograph that's, that's with that solution. Maybe John You won't be able to up. see it, but I will still yeah, turn to I was, it. And... If we had done slides tonight, I would have showed you all one photograph and this would have been it. <laughs> um, so it's an Uru woman with her daughters who live on uh, Reed Island on Lake Titicaca. And she's just gotten this uh, solar panel um, to have a distributed energy source that can replace the kerosene lamps that to date they have been using um, to light their home so that the girls can do homework at night and she can cook and all of those good things. You can imagine kerosene, A, is really dirty and expensive, also super dangerous to be burning um, on a reed island, probably. So um, I love that photograph and I think what we tried to do in a lot of the visual choices in the book was to bring in some unexpected imagery, um, you know, my God, if we had put in a picture of uh, curbside recycling bins, you would have been like, womp, womp, womp. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I love that. Also, one of my favorite stories is in Rooftop Solar, um, which dates the first rooftop solar system back to 1884. This guy named Charles Fritz, who was sort of a tinkerer, experimentalist, um, uh, figured out that these sort of very thin slices of selenium on metal panels would conduct electricity. Of course, he had no idea how this worked because Einstein was still, I don't know, 30 plus years away from doing work on photons. Um, but nonetheless, Fritz put this up on a rooftop in New York and looks out over Manhattan and is just absolutely convinced that someday these photoelectric modules will wind up competing with coal-fired power plants. And the first one of those had only come online, thanks to Edison, two years before. So we think about solar as being, you know, this sort of super new technology. And of course, silicon solar panels didn't come about until the mid 20th century. But I just, I love the history of some of the things that's here um, in the book. And, um, and, and just, yeah, kind of the way in which human beings have been working on this stuff. I mean, we really have. And, um, and it's good to know we're, we're sort of standing on the shoulders of giants um, and tinkerers uh, as we do this work. Great, thank you. Um, Jim, tell us what your favorite one was. Well, I've already said I'm a geek. Um, so naturally the refrigerant one, one, refrigerant one is, is, <laughs> is so exciting. But, but, but the reason is it's so definable of a problem. It's so isolated. Now, of course, there's ripples through the economy and what that does and cars versus you know, homes and all that. But it is so definable of a problem. I just want to say, why can't we just, just nail that one? Just jump all over that one and, and fix it. But, but kind of playing this dualist role, I also got to say just this collection of technologies that redefine just our relationships with each other. And I would put not only the family planning and, and, and women and girls education, but I'd even put the, uh, the small um, uh, holder uh, farming, agricultural practices that women um, lead as well. I'd put that in that same kind of camp. So I think the more that we can think of tangible examples and then think of the story all at the same time, it, it, just, it just helps us build momentum. Can I just say one more thing? Of course. The one other reason that rooftop solar is great um, and such like a star student in this book is because it can deliver almost three and a half trillion dollars of home energy savings um, between 2020 and 2050. So um, not all of the, most of the solutions have some cost and bigger savings associated with them, but rooftop really knocks it out of the park on that one. So. Um, We've been sort of talking about buzzwords that have been happening around this week, and clearly geek, if we weren't in church, would be the drinking game, right? Okay. So, all right, John. So I'm drawn to the photography in this book. It really is just beautiful. 
it, you can turn pages in this and just be captivated by it. So this is forest protection. That is a picture of a Komodi bear, not a polar bear, but I guess related, in the uh, Great Bear Rainforest, I think is what it's called, in British Columbia. Uh, just the stark colors, green, white, and that salmon that the bear is holding I, makes me feel like I'm outside, no matter where I am when I look at that page. Uh, so I love that, that the book has that component to it. Um, probably if I had to say a favorite technology, it would be food waste, but that's going to be an answer to another question that's coming. So uh, I'm going to instead say that uh, I'm really drawn to concentrated solar as a technology. It has lots of challenges, but it's brilliant. And I, it's the first technology since I started really learning about all things going on in the world of environmental sustainability that stopped me in my tracks because I'm used to solar panels, even if I don't fully know how they work, I mostly know how they work. I'm used to wind turbines, because I get that. But then I, I saw concentrated solar in an article for the first time a few years ago, and I was like, huh, all right. Basically, when we create electricity, these lights right now are on because we boiled water a while ago to create steam that turned turbines. So all we have to do is boil water and we've got to be able to come up with better ways than burning stuff that's been in the ground for tens to hundreds of millions of years to boil water. So uh, yeah, we can use mirrors, point them all at one spot, get that spot really dang hot and use that heat to boil water. Okay, that sounds like too, too good to be true almost. It doesn't work everywhere, but the places that it does work, it's a really brilliant technology. And it has layers that other forms of solar photovoltaics can't do. It, has, uh, it can have an integrated battery component. How? Well, if you put salt into the spot that's getting heated up to ridiculous temperatures because all these mirrors are bouncing sunlight at one spot, that salt will become molten and hold heat, sufficient heat to boil water to turn turbines for up to eight hours, which means we can use the sun's rays eight hours after the sun sets. That's a battery. And I just, I think it's so dang cool. On that, get ready to drink on the geek side. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about, because what we're all here about is to find out how we can help, right? Whether it's through our personal lives or through our business lives. So I want to talk about first, because so many of us, I know in this audience, are doing things, but what else can we do? So Catherine, why don't you start us off with a solution that you think individuals can have the most impact on? So the, the solution that is 100% free, totally in our control, and implementable immediately is plant-rich diets. So there is absolutely no reason that any sort of thoughtful human who has options about what they eat um, cannot be thinking about how to do what Michael Pollan said, which was eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, I am a vegetarian, I'm not a vegan, so I, I agree there's sort of a, a whole spectrum here on how this, how this goes, but we know that ruminants, namely uh, cows in this country, are the big, kind of the big offenders, right, because of their particular digestive system that involves fermenting cellulose um, and a lot of burping, um, and some, maybe some gas as well, but mostly burping. Um, and uh, in fact, if you ranked uh, cattle as their own nation, they would come in third behind China and the US in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a big, this is a big thing. And also amazing that it's totally in our power, right? Like unless I can put rooftop solar on my house, there's not a lot I can do immediately about what happens when I flip on a, a light switch, right? Or turn on my washing machine. Um, but we eat at least three times a day for the most part. Um, and, and it's just, I think, a, a really incredible opportunity to, to kind of, I don't know, put our values into action. Um, and we're talking about kind of all of livestock emissions are probably about a fifth of global emissions. Um, so we, we have a, a lot of control in our hands um, in, in the face of lots of other solutions that are, that are more systemic. Sean? So I'll keep the theme, and this is me coming back, to food waste. Uh, I'm really drawn uh, to food waste in terms of what individuals can do because of the multiplicity of benefits that come along with it. Similar to cattle being the third country, if food waste 
was its own country, it would also be third behind China and the United States. So we know it has a huge uh, impact from a carbon standpoint. But then you look at the fact that so many people in this world are hungry. And we're in a chapel right now. I don't know any faith tradition in the world that doesn't say feed the hungry in some way, shape, or form. We can do it. We grow enough food on this planet to do it. We also don't need the Monsantos of the world and industrial agriculture to grow enough food. We can do it in better, more holistic ways. A lot of the book is focused on how we grow that food, but the food waste component is very much something that we can all latch onto and say, no more will I waste food as an individual, and I will change my purchasing practices to try and shift the system as well. We can all do our own small part. Avoid the restaurants that put an excessive amount of food on your plate and support the ones that put a proper amount of food on your plate. Uh, buffets, you think they have a little bit of waste? I would say quite a bit. Well, you can make a decision about that sort of thing as well. Uh, so we can do it as individuals. We can try and change a broader system. In doing so, we have carbon benefits. We have benefits to underprivileged people around the world. Uh, it's a part of our daily existence how we interact with our food. Uh, so it's right there in front of us multiple times a day. Give that ugly apple some love. Yeah, ugly fruit. That's a, that's a thing on, on Twitter and elsewhere. There's a movement behind buy ugly fruit. Uh, it's important, it really is. Is that a hashtag, hashtag ugly fruit? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, good. I, I'm glad to know about that. Um, Jim, we're gonna put you back to back. So what's your personal favorite for individuals and then we'll go and, and ask what businesses can do. Okay, well, the person, I'm just going to pile on with the, with the food. And, and the only thing I can add to what they've already said is, is because we haven't made the connection between food and climate before, I think making the connection and demonstrating it and sharing it with your neighbors, inviting them over for a picnic, and, you know, have it a part of the conversation, I think, has just all kinds of benefits even beyond on that. Again, to just get us thinking about, about these issues in a different way. So I'm, I'm going on to the, the, the government and business mm -hmm. what, uh, question. What's the most thing, important thing they can do? What's, what they need well, to I do think the biggest, um, um, the biggest single thing that can be done that could just ripple through all of this is, is a simple price on carbon. End of story. In my opinion, once you do that, you let the best of markets and free enterprise do what they do best. They innovate. They come up with new solutions. You get that price in carbon. It's the same thing we said earlier. Is it going to be exactly right? Never. And you'll always argue about exactly what that right price is. But again, you know, it's better to be approximately right than dead, dead wrong. So that's, that's the short version for me for that. So I just want to say, for, if anybody doesn't know what price on carbon, the other thing you might have heard is carbon tax. Shh, tax. Shh. Bad word. OK. John? Uh, so to me, government and business are very different. And I'm going to point out the refrigerant management from a government standpoint. That's where they have a big role to play. If you look at the index of this book, where it actually lists out in order the technologies uh, that have the greatest carbon reduction potential, you'll notice at the back end or the far right column of those pages, there's the net savings of the technologies over the 30 year period that's measured. Some of the technologies have not applicable because for a variety of reasons, it's not possible to assign an economic value to them. Uh, but many of them, most of the rest, have a positive number there. So in the long term, it's worth it from a dollars and cents standpoint. That is not true with respect to two technologies. Two of them are gonna be a net cost, so basically there's no business case for it. Setting aside the carbon tax, there might become one if that were to change. Uh, they are a wave and tidal energy, and then there's refrigerant management, and the fact that it's number one. Uh, that, to me, when I see that there's no business case for something, that's, in many respects, the place that government should intervene. Where, where there's a definable market failure. Right, right. exactly, exactly. Um, on the business side, I, I'm going to punt, and the reason is business is a really hard group to lump together because, well, what's the most important thing that a utility business could be doing? Well, there's a whole section of the book on that. 
compared to a company like Interface, well, they can try and implement a number of these various technologies that are relevant to their manufacturing process because they are a manufacturing company. I, but then you look at any of the big accounting firms and their business model is fundamentally different. And small businesses as well, maybe they look more like a household in terms of what they can do. It's really difficult to say. So the answer is uh, the most important thing that a business can be doing is up to that business. I hope they read the book. Somebody at the company with authority to create change reads the book and gets inspired to do one, two, three, or more of these things for their business. Great, thank you. Okay, with the U.S. out of the Paris, this is a one-week anniversary, unfortunately, for today. I know many of us were dismayed with last Thursday's announcement. Now that we are out of the Paris Climate Agreement, how should we reshape the conversation on climate? Anybody want to go first? Okay. I'm going to go first because I practiced some of this on the Weather Channel last week. <laughs> um, where I had really great hair and makeup, so I don't have that going for me. But um, I, I don't think in terms of what we need to do, I actually don't think that much has changed. Um, but either in terms of what I think we should be doing in terms of how we frame the, the, the issue and, um, and our action, or actually on what action is going to be taken. So I'll, I'll explain. Um, the solutions exist. They're here. They're scaling. They've left the station. There are a lot of things that Washington could do, namely putting a price on carbon through a carbon tax or a cap and trade system um, that would accelerate all of them. But the reality is, is that for the most part, progress that has been made on emissions in this country has been made in spite of Washington, right? It has happened because select cities, enlightened states, enlightened companies like Interface, right? There have been leaders leading, and I think those leaders are going to continue to do what they've done. Um, and, and in fact, maybe even step it up more uh, in light of, of the White House announcement. Um, I think we need, to, we need to be saying that, right? We have the solutions, they're scaling, we're doing them. We, we need to be talking about that. Um, and I think also we need to be saying that um, there is an economic reality, but it's not the economic reality that we heard uh, from the White House. So pursuing the solutions to reverse global warming is an enormous economic opportunity, aside from a couple which at least in the near term don't have such an obvious um, business case, but probably will in, in a few decades um, as, uh, as, as government takes a lead in advancing them. Um, and, and we need to be comfortable saying that, right? Um, that is the big weapon that's getting used against us, I think, is, oh, you people and you care so much about this planet and you're gonna tank the economy. I think we just, we've been trying to say for a long time, oh, that's a false dichotomy, but I think, Things like the, the number and drawdown, which is that the, that the world stands to save almost $75 trillion in the pursuit of these solutions between now and 2050. Like, let's get out there and say those things. Um, yeah, and, and I'm hopeful that, um, that the climate movement has ultimately been galvanized, um, that you know, we may be doubled in size overnight. Um, may that be so. Jim? Well, from your comments, my brain just went in three different directions, so I'll try to bring, bring some coherency uh, to this. But the fundamental, I guess, the, 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 the foundation of this is um, a, a, a phrase that I did hear Ray say many times, and I, I worked with him through a, um, a uh, federal advisory committee to the White House in the late 90s, literally President Clinton's President's Council on Sustainable Development. And um, at times we were just aghast at what we saw that was so obvious that wasn't getting, getting done. But he started saying the, the phrase that, well, in his mind, politicians are those people that are just looking for a parade to get in front of. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, there's a parade that a bunch of people missed that somebody got out in front of. Okay, so our job is to create a better, more fun, more exciting, more profitable, more innovative, parade that creates more friends along the way. But not in the old language of, 
we're going to take the hill and we're going to fight and we're going to slash this and, you know, you know the, the antagonistic military, you know, each approach. Let's just create a better way. We just need to create a better way and say we have this collection of solutions and the more we practice those solutions, the more we're going to develop a culture and mindset of how this all works and 100 solutions is going to turn into 1,000 and it's going to turn into a million. And that's how we create a parade that pretty soon all the politicians are going to climb on over each other to get in front of our parade, and then we'll let them. And we're going to have great music. Really, great, really music. great marching bands. How do we reverse climate change through one heck of a party? That's what I'm hearing. I'm ready. This is the best solution yet. Absolutely. <laughs> I can throw a really good party. And I, we know. <laughs> John? I think Paris is a bit of a paradox. It is simultaneously one of the, if not the, most important milestone in the climate movement and, in some ways, meaningless. It's symbolic. It's non-binding. It's voluntary. It's remarkable that so many countries could come together and agree on a few really important things, but they just agreed on what they planned to do. We actually have to do it, and fortunately, the United States of America does not need the federal government to do anything. Well, at least with respect to reversing climate change. Kudos to Hawaii. They said, we'll just go ahead and sign the thing as a state. Good for them for doing it. And you've seen so many cities stand up and say, I don't care what happens in Washington. We're in. We're committed. So I'm not that worried about what happened regarding the Paris Climate Accord in the United States last week. I, it's easy for me to just say, ultimately the make or the break is gonna come from other sectors. And heck, it's possible that we might look back on this when people, maybe Catherine, write the book about the success of reversing global warming and say, you know, we needed a few shocks to the system that galvanized cities and states, but more importantly, communities, individuals, businesses, to stand up and say, oh, it's on us. Let's get to work. Great. Okay, we've got two more questions and we're gonna open up for discussion. In light of the withdrawal, did I do that twice? Okay, in light of the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, um, how can drawdown specifically help us achieve the goal anyway? So I think for a long time, the climate movement has had, a, we've, this has been a recurring theme tonight, a story problem, but a vision problem, right? So certainly we have suffered from the complexity of the issue from its diffuseness in time and space, um, from a very well-funded um, misinformation campaign, right? All of those things um, have been uh, difficult variables, but we also have not helped ourselves in terms of what is it that we're working towards besides averting catastrophe, right? Um, I was trying to kind of crystallize this for some college students a couple weeks ago, and this seemed to help, which was, can you imagine if Martin Luther King Jr. had stood up at the March on Washington and said, I have a nightmare. <laughs> it is awful, and all of you people are implicated in it. But, you know, maybe you can do a little something here or there, and, uh, you know, maybe it won't be awful. Right? I, like, what have we been doing? <laughs> um, I, I really hope that, that Drawdown um, helps with the vision problem, right? And, um, and can help to call us to our better angels, right? So not I have a nightmare, but I have a dream. And there's an ideal that we all aspire towards, which is that we are all created equal and that maybe someday we can live in a beloved community. That is the kind of vision that I think we need around, around climate, and I, I hope that Drawdown helps us get there. John? Uh, so I'm gonna 
not directly answer the question, but I'm going to say something that's important and that it's probably a little bit harder for Catherine to say. This is me putting on my board hat here. Um, what Drawdown can do is not just write a book and get as many copies sold as possible. The work of the organization continues and it's not going to be financed by buying more of these. Though please, if you've got your hands on a copy, buy another one and give it to somebody. We would love that. And give it to a library. <laughs> yes, gosh yes. Um, there's, there's a lot more work to be done around getting this book out and getting it scaled and the organization um, wants to keep working on this and they're gonna need support uh, to do so. So if you might be moved um, from a financial standpoint to uh, get involved. Again, please buy another copy, but also consider supporting the organization itself. Uh, 501c3, it, it thrives when more people join this movement and say it's worth supporting. Jim? Well, there's a, a, a hundred uh, calculated solutions and a bunch of others in the back there. Um, so obviously there's, those are examples of things you can do. Um, well along the process of trying to transform interface, um, there were lists of things that were logically, reasonably, engineering-wise, scientifically obvious that we needed to do, and we just couldn't get them done. And you talk about, oh, it's that uh, corporate culture that gets in the way, like our consumerist culture, our you know, culture, culture, culture is in, in the way, and we've got to change our culture. Well, the more research you, know, you, you, you study and the more experiences you have, you realize the best way to change culture is to actually start doing something small and do it over and over and over and over again and all those accumulated actions start to shift the culture. You don't shift the culture by pushing the culture, you start doing in things. So there's a hundred things in there to start doing. Pick the ones that you get most cranked up about and just start doing them and tell your friends about it. And, and by doing it and by doing it over and over and over again, that's, that's how we change the, the, the big narrative as well as build the momentum and more innovations that now, as I said, 100 ideas will turn into 1,000, will turn into a million. Great, okay, last question. Um, for environmentalists, this has been a particularly challenging political se season. We need hope, we need dreams. So what keeps you going each day in regards to the work that you're doing to protect the planet? John? I have a 10-month-old at home and I do what I do for him, uh, and I feel like that was one of the uh, commands, if you will, that my grandfather gave to me. He said that he did this work for tomorrow's child, so I feel like that's a pretty good reason for me to do this work as well. Uh, and going home to my son every night just reminds me that he's gonna be around this planet a lot longer than I will, and it's gonna be worse for him than it was for me if we don't work on this. Uh, but the real, I'd say, personal reason that I am hopeful, it, it's, it's related to the, just the fact that this book gives us reason to hope. I mean, it's what Catherine has talked about so eloquently tonight. It changes the conversation from doom and gloom to something positive. Uh, but within that, I want to put a, a point on what resonates most with me. Hope is a choice. You can look at the doom and gloom, and you can look at the positivity, and it's not like something is going to make you believe it. You have to choose to have your own personal beliefs. You have to choose what attitude you're going to have. I choose hope every single day because I enjoy the way it makes me feel, and I think I can do more to fix the problems and create this amazing world of the future if I go in with the spirit of hope. Jim? Well, I want to have to say a very similar thing. Um, I remember sitting in a, a very ugly kind of ceiling, was water stained with, with leaks, uh, conference room in a hotel, listening to this carpet guy give his first 20 minute speech on sustainability. Roughly 10, 15 a.m., August 31st, 1994. Give or take a minute or two. Um, that afternoon, I was racing around Atlanta trying to find Paul Hawkins' book, Ecology Commerce. I started reading it. Every day, I read something else. Every day, I read something else. And pretty soon, it seemed like every day, every page I turned, the news was worse. Right? 
don't know if you feel like that sometimes. You know, I had been, you know, energetic, aggressive, probably a little too ambitious at times, you know, professional guy. I was always up in the morning. I was having trouble getting out of work. I mean, getting out of bed because it was so demoralizing. I don't know the date, I don't remember exactly, but, but almost like you said, there was one morning I woke up and it was an absolutely conscious, rational choice to choose to be a part of the solution. And it was some of the very same words that you used came into me, at, you know, into my mind at that time. You know, it's going to be an awful life to spend the rest of my life, you know, afraid of all this stuff. I've got tools, I know people, I've been trained, let's be a part of it. And, and, and you, it, it, then it just changes your orientation. Um, the, the, the fear is so dominating our whole culture these days. Consciously choose to take another, another track and it'll have a huge impact, I believe. All right, Catherine, we'll wrap up with you. Yeah. Um, in the darkness of last November, I thought about this a lot because I, I know enough about myself to know that nothing makes me more depressed and more hopeless than stepping onto the sidelines. And at the same time, I think as, um, as activists, as um, advocates, we have to think about, for each of ourselves, right, how is it that you stay in what um, Parker Palmer calls the tragic gap? Um, Anyone who's thinking about these questions, I think Parker's work is just wonderful, right? But this, it is a tragic gap to sit between the world where we are now and the world as we know that it can be. Um, and, and how do you stay there without flipping into total cynicism or fear um, or just the sort of like, gee whiz, optimism, like surely we'll get there someday. Like how do you stay in that place? Um, so I went back to something that I'd written in November about how to stay courageous and committed and to hold the brokenness and the beauty of the world at the same time. And my recipe for myself pretty much boils down to, f to four things. One is community, so getting with my people, right? Um, the, the, the people who like, you know, have their hands dirty and their feet wet in this um, work or, or related work of, of, of kind of building the kind of world that we know we want to have. Um, getting my ass to the mountains is really big. Like, if I just am in a bad place, like, I just need to go to a bluff and see a sunset, um, and, and that will fix most things. Uh, poetry. I read a lot of Mary Oliver and Wendell Berry when I'm in a dark, sad place about the world. The Piece of Wild Things is really wonderful. Um, poem, and then sometimes whiskey. So that's, <laughs> um, it's some combination of those things. <laughs> Thank goodness There is a common element with some of Church. our friends. <laughs> okay, so they have really fed us, right? I mean, they have really fed us and give us a lot of hope and a lot of ideas. Now it's your turn to give feedback to them because clearly these folks are going all over the world and sharing information. So let's feed them with ideas, feedback, and um, stories. I have one microphone. This is going to be really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you to come right here in the middle. That will be easier and we'll save more time handing off the microphone. Yeah. Charlotte, my intern, is going to hand off the microphone. Y'all just create a line if you want. Um, and, and we'll go from there. Please give us your name, and, um, and if, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of us are from Decatur, but if you're not from Decatur, tell us how far you drove to get here, and we appreciate you getting here. Hi. Uh, Dan May, I drove three miles in a Prius. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, That's uh, a solution. And, <laughs> and something on, the, on a price in carbon, but first, Beth, don't call it a carbon tax. Call it a carbon fee and dividend. Okay. Where, the, where the money is not kept by the government, but it gets returned to the public. And is, is Bill Witherspoon here? And you need to hold the microphone up closer so Bill, we can... Yeah, hi. Okay. Sorry, there he is. Hey, um, just, just to let you know, Bill and I have a presentation on uh, carbon fee and dividend. What it is, why we need it, how it works, how it affects the economy, how to build the political will to bring it about. And uh, get in touch with one of us afterward. Or, or Henry Slack there. So we now have and the largest but it, but networking the question, group. But I, I'm supposed to ask a question. 
uh, I guess Bill or anyone on uh, carbon, uh, putting a price on carbon, what number was that on the list and how much effect would it have? So it's not, um, so you can think about a whole bunch of things as accelerants to these solutions. So the solutions actually drill down to a specific technology or a specific practice that actually does the work of reducing emissions. Um, so the ultimate accelerant, as I think we're all in agreement with, um, is, is a price on carbon, right? And, and then it impacts all of these. So the modeling in the book assumes that there is no price on carbon. So everything that's projected here, you can imagine happening at greater scale, except for the things where we assume that you get to 100% um, and, and faster. Uh, uh, work, I, I, I forgot the former Congress's name, but his organization is called Republic EN. Um, there's some- Inglis, yes. Yeah, yeah, Bob, Inglis. I went brain dead there for a second. So a bunch coming up and ideas and that's what we need is we need a foment of these ideas from different parts of the spectrum to come up with better solutions. So that's that's what I think that's exciting. exciting. Next. Hi, um, my name is Melissa Vickery, came in from Marietta in an electric leaf carpool. <laughs> Yay, double wing. <laughs> I had known because I came from East Cobb and it was a oh, dis yeah, disaster. <laughs> um, so I'm starting really at this very close level of activity, which is getting involved with recycling. Always have been trying to get my church involved. Um, and I pick up all the stuff that can be recycled as I walk to the park and back. Took my niece with me and taught her that. Um, worked with the city of Marietta picking up. Um, I, I notice how it's killing the fish, it wraps around the turtles, wraps around uh, the wildlife, I mean, just keeping stuff out of the creeks. My question has to do with what has happened and what we can do to teach at such a young age. I, I know I learned not to throw stuff out the window. I don't remember who taught me that, um, but apparently a lot of people either don't know or don't care. I, I asked one of the ladies I was picking up stuff with, and she's, I said, why do they not care? And she says, Melissa, when you don't know what you're going to eat that day, you lecturing what 100 years from now means, it just whew, goes over their head. So anyway, educating kids better and caring, or adults, any ideas on why we're not doing the most basic stuff for the planet? in reducing our ho household um, recyclables. I'll just say, I think, um, to me, the biggest thing is to make things easy um, and or fun. So there's this wonderful, uh, there's a wonderful video of um, uh, coming out of a subway. You've got an escalator on one side, and every day everyone rides the escalator, and no one walks up the stairs. And then one day, they install one of those piano things, like in Big, you know, where Tom Hanks does his thing, right? And then all of a sudden, when the stairs are a piano, nobody uses the escalator. Everybody uses the stairs. So I think part of, part of the, um, the challenge for us is to think about, like, how, how we know about how human behavior works. We know better than we think we do, actually. So how do we think about making things easy and fun? and rewarding. Um, and I think that'll get us a lot of the way there. Um, you know, the more sort of slippery and invisible <laughs> things can become, um, the better. Uh, not, this is not gonna be a satisfactory answer because I don't know, my grandfather struggled with this. He would often say, throw away? There is no away. Uh, I also, when, when, you, when you say this, it's, it's gotten me thinking. Um, the, there's a, an important point that you started making, and I want to build upon it. Uh, when you're worried about what you're going to eat, then you don't worry about things like where you throw it away, uh, or what you throw away. It, it's, it highlights that environmental challenges, pollution, and social challenges of a wide range are so interconnected. In fact, I'm willing to say an absolutism here. 
There is no environmental challenge that does not have a social component. And we need to recognize those linkages. Uh, and then finally, it'd be nice if our society were to avoid certain words or treat them as bad words that right now are celebrated. And I think it would help in this respect. Disposable. There are, packet, there are products that have that word on their branding as a, look at us, we're great, we're disposable. Disposable should be a bad word. We should see that and avoid. Plastic, plastic spoons, plastic straws, those things are fundamentally designed to be disposable. Reject them. Well, just quickly, I might, might add, in, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, and I don't, I'm not an expert on this, they may be in the room, but there were pretty sophisticated um, PSAs, ad campaigns, ad council about litter, the, the, the movie with uh, the, actually the Italian guy that was, you know, acted like an Indian for so long, I think he, you know, American Indian, that he'd convinced himself that he was, but with the tear in his, in his eye. Um, but there was a pretty sophisticated approach to trying to communicate that, and, and essentially, for a for a while, it became socially unacceptable. I mean, I would honk at people if I saw them, you know, throw something out their window. And so it, there was a herd mentality that's just 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 not the way we do things. And and maybe actually, with our 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 wealth and of the last few years, maybe that's that's kind of lost its way. But but there are social norms that we should we should think about trying to support. Maybe. I don't know. So I'm going to say two things really quickly. One is, is a generation of Americans remember the crying Indian on the L.A. freeway, even if they didn't know where L.A. was on a map, right? I mean, we all, for those of us of a particular age, I'm not revealing, um, we remember that ad. But it is a cultural identity spot for everyone. Why we don't have those ads anymore on TV, even if it's at midnight, I do not know. It may have something to do with the industry that we're trying to make less disposable. Yeah. Um, well, just that, to add, go on. I was just going to say that there was a study I saw that three of the most uh, recognizable images of that era were Eyes Cody, the, the tear, uh, Earth Moon, or Earth Rising, you know, the picture of, of Earth from the moon, seeing it rise, and the uh, naked little girl running from the Napalm Village in Vietnam. The three most recognizable images of that of that era, and it had a lasting impact on who who we are, but it's fading. So, and there are a lot less Girl Scouts, right? I mean, if you were a Girl Scout, you definitely got the litter, the litter bug speech. Um, now this is totally random and really doesn't have anything to do with your question, but I want you all to think about this. Why aren't escalators motion sensors? Has anybody thought about that? See, that's how sad my life is. I spend time thinking about, like, why can't we put motion sensors on escalators? Okay, next question. Thank you so much for coming from Marietta. Hi there. My name's Betty Bentley Watson, and I live in Midtown Atlanta. And uh, this may be answered on your website. I'm not sure so um, yet. So if it is, just I guess it'll be a home run question. But I'm curious about um, efforts that, um, to get the book and the message on the website in front of members of Congress, particularly key committees and um, state legislatures. Um, and kind of along the same veins, um, how is the interface with other um, big associations and organizations in the United States, the League of Conservation Voters, Environmental Defense Fund, Fund 350, and all those guys? And what can we do to help with that? Um, Hello? Hello. Uh, so, <clears throat> We have, we have work to do, I think, on, on many of those things. We have a really amazing board of directors. We have a really amazing advisory board of, I think now more than 130 some people, um, many with ties to various um, NGOs. Uh, at Martin O'Malley is, um, is on our board of directors. So we, we have, we, I think we have some of that sort of built into the coalition. Um, and also, there are so many audiences to get in front of. Um, I think at the moment we're not we're not prioritizing politicians, um, and maybe you have thoughts about that, John. But um, we're kind of doing really broad uh, kind of uh, swaths and and trying to to hit as many people as we can. Of course, what happens right when when think of the book as beta. I like what John said. Like this is not the end. Um, 
you know, but that hits and the first kind of audiences that you naturally encounter are the true believers, right? The people who've been like, <laughs> when's it gonna be done, you know? So I, I think it also kind of takes a bit of time for the ripples to, to move out from there, but maybe John has. I just wanted to say that yes, it's available on the website. It will redirect to a place where you would typically buy the book, Amazon. Penguin published it, so it's broadly available. Um, no, I don't really have much to add. Uh, it's a good question, a challenging one, and I'll tell you when I don't know, and right now I don't know. Jim, do you have a... Well, I'm, I'm not involved with the organization, but I just know there was such a rush to meet the publishing day. You know, Paul Hawken was... He, you know, he scheduled this vacation to Mexico or whatever because he knew it'd be done, and, and I'd reached him for something else, and he's pounding away in Mexico. <laughs> finish, uh, finish it up. So it was like, get to, the, you know, get to the finish line, get it out, and let's start conversations. And, 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 I, and I'd almost agree to, right now, avoid the politicians. Let's start our own parade. So I am going to say something about politicians. Um, for those of you who know me, this is not surprising. I was at an event last week and there was a 15 term, 30 year veteran congressman who was talking about energy and he could not, the perfect solution to say was, well, there's only 78,000 coal jobs, but there are now 300,000 solar jobs in the United States. And he could not even, that, that should have been the first thing out of his mouth. And it didn't ever come out of his mouth, and he's been there for 30 years, and he serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House of Representatives. So my thing is, is if we can't even get the congressmen who are friendly towards us to be able to start shouting out things that people are tweeting every day, then we've got to figure out a way to make that happen. Okay, thank you for your question. Hi, I'm Melora Furman, and I work in downtown Decatur, so I didn't have very far to come here. Um, <laughs> First, I wanted to say to Beth, the question about why aren't escalators motion sensitive, it may have something to do with technology and maintenance because I asked a very similar question um, to an engineer who worked for the city of Atlanta and I said, why when I go up to one of those walk buttons, I mean, why do when I go up to an intersection, is the light automatic instead of you know, my being able to push a button when I needed it and need it. And he said, um, because those things break a lot and we can't afford to fix them. So there could be some technological issues there. But um, going back to the reason I'm standing here, and I wanted to ask the same question that the last person asked. Um, and I, I think I just want to say, because she asked it and you all responded, that I think it's really important to get the message out. Um, I work in an environment where there are people who don't really care about conserving, about recycling, about turning off lights. I go around, you know, like the school marm reminding them <laughs> or turning off lights at the end of the day and having this, hey, I'm still working here. Um, and there also is one individual who's, who just denies that uh, First of all, that the climate, it, the, the temperature of the globe is warming, and secondly, that there is climate change. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I've thought about it, and I think there are reasons why people want to deny something that is so apparent and that so many people have confirmed and affirmed. Um, and I don't know if you can really get around that, but I think it is really important to make inroads and to talk to the leaders and even if it seems kind of hopeless because of the current administration, the politicians really do make legislation and um, pass legislation and that in the end becomes more important than individuals who are deniers, um, you know, beliefs about the subject because it, it, it compels businesses and people to do things. So, you know, just courage onward and upward. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Melora. Thank you all for being here, and Beth for 
leading this. I'm Henry Slack. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Henry Slack, and I'm a leader with the Citizens Climate Lobby here in Atlanta, and I want to start a chapter in DeKalb County. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. It'd be this fall. But meanwhile, I'm about to go to Washington uh, because our national conference is about to start, and I'll be meeting with uh, congressmen. I just love the idea of the politician just looking for a parade to get in front of. <laughs> Because that's what praise. I wouldn't mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's what Citizens Climate Lobby does. Is we're trying to create the parade. We're getting endorsements from politicians and city councils and newspapers, so that they say, "Oh, that it, there's a parade. I can I can be a leader." Um, and my question, though, is how can we make some of these things go more viral? And especially, I'm thinking of the food waste and uh, the uh, vegetable-rich diet, because I mean, things do go viral, you know. We, YouTube did not exist 15 years ago, and Instagram and all these other things that I hate to be involved with because I'm an old guy. Uh, but, you know, uh, is there, have you run across anything we can, we can join in with that? There are, um, there are some, some things that it, are in the book um, in terms of kind of accelerants on both of those fronts. Um, obviously, countries, again, to the, to the importance of policy, countries that have simply said, grocery stores, you can't throw away anything. You have to find another better uh, outlet for it, right? That's a, a super effective way to put a big dent um, in, into food waste. I, you know, we talked about the ugly fruits and that there, I think there are sort of viral tactics that are happening. I think on the side of, um, of plant-rich diets, um, I think already kind of the attraction to, to, to local foods, to f kind of closer connection to, um, to, to farms, I think that's helping, right? Um, I think, uh, I personally think that there's a big impact to have um, with meat substitutes. I think the reality is that p people's pal palates are unlikely to change. So if you can feed someone something that tastes like a hamburger but is um, better for the environment, better for their bodies, and maybe cheaper, um, then perhaps they will they will eat that. So I'm a big believer in, in Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods and some of the things that they're working on. Um, I think on the kind of more social movement side, Meatless Mondays, Vegan Before Six, like. These kinds of things where you can sort of say, this is the thing that I'm doing, I think really helps. Um, and then simple things like the norm. The norm in schools, hospitals, institutions of all stripes should be that we eat plant-based food. Um, and, and it's like a, you know, instead of, oh, do you, could you possibly make me a peanut butter and jelly? <laughs> right? I think, again, like if you can sort of just shift some of those norms, um, that makes a lot of sense. I will also say, in terms of making things go viral, you've got to have the content and the material to do so. Fortunately, there are a lot of food-focused organizations out there, some specifically tailored to food waste, some specifically tailored to plant-rich diets. They've got the material. Is that Bill Bowling that I see in the back as well? Yeah, I thought it was. For example, uh, the work that Bill does, he's created a lot of the material that uh, can be supported and, and pushed. Uh, in addition, if you find an organization talking about food and they're not talking about the climate component, educate them. Let them know that this book exists so that they can add that to their messaging. Hashtag drawdown. It, it is an official hashtag. hashtag. Jim, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. I'm Marjorie Macy and I came from Canton. I was one of the five in the leaf. <laughs> My first time in one. Uh, uh, and it was a wonderful experience. I was at the Carter Center for the previous presentation and my heart was just pounding. The man sitting next to me had a book and uh, my husband helped me with taking turns in line and we bought 20. And, uh, we've already gone, we've given away four. They've, to me, they're like gold. It's finally, real science. And turning off the lights did never feel like enough to me. Um, so we've gotten a lot of individual ideas of things that I can do and you can do, and, and, and we still need to do those things. But I came here 
something that was said at the Carter Center was, we're looking for you people to come up with things that we can do in Atlanta. And so I came here looking for some kind of a coalition, opportunities to brainstorm. Um, I love to be in a group where we feed off one another and out of that sometimes comes new ideas or at least more specific ways to implement old ideas. Um, so would you just speak to that? Have you met Henry? Yeah. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, so, so one of the things that was really important for Drawdown uh, was not to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I think there is such in incredibly good grassroots work being done by Citizens Climate Lobby, by 350.org, um, of course by Sierra Club for, for eons. Um, we don't want to, we don't want to sort of just replicate, um, but I think those are, are great places for community and, and I would love to hear, you know, from, from being in the, the, the trenches of local work, how, how people think about Drawdown um, and how helpful it is and what sort of, sort of additional or supporting materials um, we might produce that would, would help accelerate um, local work too. Well, I, I might add, um, um, it's actually going to end up sounding a lot like a plug for the organization I'm on the board of directors of, but Georgia Interfaith Power and Light. Um, obviously, one of the things it's done over the years is go around and help churches um, have energy audits and help them re you know, reduce their energy consumption. But a new thing that's really starting to grow is, 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 is helping and encouraging churches of every type houses of worship of every type to form their own green teams and not just think about the science and the, and, and, and the bill and the money it will save, but, but let's, let's, let's start using that strength and that way of seeing the world and have conversations about you know, who we are and why are we here and what does that mean to our faith and this creation and why we're here. We need to add that conversation to this scientific, economic, you know, economic, political debate because that's 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 more that's 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 more who we are. It's the heart. That's 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 the heart, and that's what the real meaning is. So, um, it, there's there's churches that are creating some really great things, and I'll say mine, Peachtree Road United Methodist Church. Just just yesterday, we had a little celebration for for two you know, electric car charging stations in the parking lot, well, there need to be 20, you know, but two's the start. <laughs> but, but let's form as many conversations with like-minded people to move this thing forward. Houses of Worship are an incredible place, and particularly Southern, um, to have a, a, a big impact in this conversation. I don't know, I went on a rant there. That's all right, and I'm going to really take um, a little leeway, and I apologize, because y'all didn't come to hear me, you came to hear our esteemed panelists. But I've been doing some work up in Greenville, South Carolina, and I ran across a nonprofit called Loaves and Fishes. Now, for those of us who are Christians, it's backwards, so it's hard to remember. But what they do is, is they identified the food waste problem in Greenville. And they have an army of 100 volunteers and some money, and they go and pick up food from institutions and schools and churches and restaurants, and they are diverting food waste, right? Or food that would be wasted, I think is more important. It's edible food, but it, it would normally go in the trash can. And I was like, why don't we have this in Atlanta? Now, let's be honest. The fact that you're still enthusiastic about a leaf after coming from Marietta, I applaud you. Canton. Yay. Well, Canton. I came okay, from sorry, Canton. Canton. I'm sorry. I forgot um, to say. But, uh, but, you know, why can't we have a Loaves and Fishes Decatur or Marietta, Atlanta? I mean, they've diverted two and a half million pounds in 25 years in Greenville, which is half the size of DeKalb. And this was one of the things that I thought personally might be a good thing to get people excited about tonight. And so if you're excited about working on something like that, you can contact Gipple and we'll see if we can't start solving something. How about that? Next. Hi, my name is Lisa. Um, I live in Decaturish, um, and <laughs> I, um, I I was excited earlier to hear you guys talking about uh, the importance of social impact and environmentalism, because um, social justice and the environment are two things that I've always been passionate about, and I feel like it's really only the last few years that I've really started to hear them be combined a lot more. Um, you know, I mean, it's environmental justice has been a thing for a long time, but I feel like it's been 
it's become a lot more people have become aware of it recently. Um, and uh, so I have this maybe kind of a wonky question, um, but y'all are geeks, so <laughs> I think I hope that's okay. Um, but it's about number 39, um, about indigenous people and um, land sovereignty, indigenous people land sovereignty. So um, I spent um, some time at Standing Rock last Thanksgiving, and um, and I just when I read that chapter, it reminded me of a banner that I saw at an action there, which said, um, Indige "Indigenous sovereignty protects water." Um, and I'm, I'm assuming from my reading of the section that you're, that the modeling was based on just protecting the land that indigenous people currently hold. Um, but I'm curious if there was any modeling or if it could be possible to model both the feasibility and the impact of number one, expanding the land held by indigenous people and number two, learning from indigenous people and imitating their practices for management of larger pieces of land. Yeah, I'm opening the book because I want to give you exact numbers. Um, so currently, indigenous peoples have secure land tenure on 1.3 billion acres around the world. And what we, what we know is that there are higher rates of carbon sequestration on that land because of particular land use practices and lower rates of, of deforestation. So what uh, the assumption that's been made in the model is that forest land, in particular, that's under indigenous uh, tenure grows by just a little bit over 900 million acres um, by 2050. So it's it's really looking at um, yeah the expansion of, um, of of indigenous land rights onto more acreage, and then essentially. Again, we tried to make uh, quite conservative assumptions throughout throughout the work. So we didn't look at the impact of carbon sequestration of particular farming practices and things like that. But we looked at um, reduced deforestation, and that's what drives the impact for for this solution. Um, but it's a really it's a really interesting one, and it's you know the the modeling and the the, the assumptions in the modeling are one piece, but there's a, a lot of content that goes kind of beyond uh, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of the analysis. And this is one that I think is, is quite cool. So thank you for asking. Okay, and we're gonna take, okay. I wanna be really respectful of everyone. Those are the folks who have waited in line, so thank you. But also, we're at 8.30, so I'm going to give our panelists grace. If you need to leave, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'm willing to take the last three questions if y'all are. We're good, okay. Mm -hmm. I do have a date at nine. All right, so make it fast. Catherine's got a date. Listen, no one wants to stand in the way of a date. Um, my name is Will, and I have to drive back to Smyrna when I leave here. Uh, I'm very curious. I saw Paul speak on, on Charlie Rhodes. Totally loved it. Um, but I'm curious about collaboration with non-traditional stakeholders. You all mentioned Sierra Club and other groups, but what are some non-traditional stakeholders that we can carry this message to and again, share that positive energy, the I have a dream to try to change the dynamic and just share information. Yeah. Um, look, there are four people up here tonight. We are all white. If this were a typical environmental panel, we would all be men. Yeah. Um, you know, the environmental movement has really sucked <laughs> at diversity, <laughs> just to put it quite bluntly. Um, and, and, and there are, you know, many, many, many decades of, of, I think, historical reasons for that. But I think um, there's work for, for all of us to do. And I don't think that drawdown by any means can, um, can reach every important stakeholder group. What I hope we've created is something that can travel. Um, so if there are stakeholder groups that you're involved with, others are involved with, um, that you think need to hear the message of drawdown. Um, we hope that you'll take it to them or you'll reach out to us and say, could you come speak to you know, X, Y, or Z um, group, connect with these folks. So we're, um, we know that we've got a lot of work to do and we're also uh, depending on the community that builds around the book and around the organization also to help us reach the breadth and, and diversity of folks that, that we need to connect with. Uh, so I'll, I'll add some thoughts. Uh, similar to what I said about food, find the organizations working on various social causes that are mentioned in this and make sure they're talking about the carbon piece as well, if you have connections there, if it's a cause that matters to you. Because uh, groups that are focused on educating women in the developing world may not be talking about the carbon benefits. And if they do, a whole 
large group of people are going to hear a message about climate change that they wouldn't hear otherwise if we can get the messages aligned. Um, I'll also say I, I'm a Roman Catholic and one of the other board members for Gipple is Susan Varlamov and she led an amazing effort here in Atlanta to get the Archdiocese of Atlanta to adopt a climate action plan. And it really goes to the power of one person, one champion who has dual interests, climate change and X, to make X a part of the climate change movement. Uh, it, so if, if you know somebody who's passionate about another cause and you think that they might be willing to be a champion for climate action as well, talk to them about it, encourage them to do so. Uh, and you'll see different stakeholders realize that their interests are aligned. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna address this as you sit down because this is very, very important to me as a person acting in my faith. Environmental justice, I've been doing Southeast Green for nine years. Environmental justice didn't come up until about year five that I was doing work in the environmental movement. And, and, and we are right. We, this is, diversity is growing, but it's not fast enough. However, I was in Birmingham speaking to a group and um, a African-American woman in, um, who was a neighborhood activist gave me the best answer to this question, which is, you come to us and you want from us. I am working in my neighborhood every single day and we do environmental work every single day. We just don't call it environmental. And so I think one of the challenges for us is, is to stop going to people and ask them to join us. And we as environmentalists, all of us who are working on this, we are tasked to bring our message to them and stop expecting them to show up for us. Okay. All right. I'm off the soapbox. My mom's a preacher. Hi. Uh, my name's Talia and I'm from New Zealand. Um, I actually had no idea about this book until my dear friend said, hey, come to this. So I'm stoked to be here, stoked to have <laughs> learned about this book. <laughs> that <Thank> one. <laughs> um, I'm passionate about climate anyway, but so I've got on a big flight, 13 hours from New Zealand to the USA, to Houston, two hours from Houston to Atlanta. Here I am, passionate about the environment, but kind of on my back thinking, but I've just traveled. So I'm really interested in what your personal opinions on travel are. How do we, you know, how do I go and have, how do I learn about the world and not donate to climate? What number is telepresence? Yeah. <laughs> so so I, 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 can, I can tell no, you. No, no, we love having you here. So I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I, I can tell you exactly what's in the, in the opening paragraph of the, um, of the solutions that's focused on airplane fuel efficiency, which is that mobility is a social good, right? Um, being in a connected world, traveling, seeing loved ones, um, this is really important. Uh, and I think there is clear kind of uh, advancement that can happen with the technology so that we can fly more efficiently. Um, beyond that, there's, and it's not modeled, but there are interesting things coming with, um, with uh, bio jet fuels. So I think, I, th I think there's some stuff that's promising. I think also we travel too much, um, and we certainly travel too much for business. So the other solution that's in here is, um, is telepresence, which is just like a weird, the picture is like a weird iPad, a man's face on an iPad on a th robot stick um, ro rolling around, right? Uh, but, you know, I, all of us have, um, if you have had a job where you have to travel, you're like, why am I at the airport on Monday morning? This is awful. So um, that's another one where I think technology will help us cut out um, unnecessary travel uh, and, and end up saving businesses a lot of money in the process. Thank you. Well, and I just might add is just, just to take responsibility for the debt. You know, everything we do has positives and negatives. Just take responsibility. I mean, I think it was 97 that Interface started offsetting all of its, all of its air travel, all of its corporate cars. It's, it's, we need to go see. We need to be there. It's, it has a burden. Let's take care of it. Go forward. Yeah, I would just say make it count. If you are going to travel, offset the carbon if you can. If you can't, that's fine. Just make sure that the trip was awesome. <laughs> yes. Because... Yeah, and there was a party. It's whiskey. Yeah. And a parade. My name is Myrtle Lewin, and I came about seven miles in a hybrid. Um, 
I don't have a question so much as a comment. In Atlanta, there are lots and lots of organizations that deal with food, food distribution of the kind that you were speaking about in, in was it Greenville, Greensboro? <laughs> um, and Bill Bowling probably knows about many of them. One of them is Second Helpings Atlanta, and uh, um, it's been going for about a decade or more, and we do a lot of food distribution, picking up from schools and, and uh, um, supermarkets and what have you, and delivering to, to shelters. There are lots of organizations that are food distribution places like the Toka Hills um, Community Alliance. And I just want to, in a certain sense, thank you for having suggested that what I need to do as an environmentalist is connect what I do with Second Helpings with environmental ideas, make that connection much more explicit and perhaps try to communicate that connection to the organization. So if anybody would like to do anything like this in Atlanta, just, just Google Second Helpings Atlanta and you'll find it. Okay, and if, if do you, is there a list, Bill, do you have a list of all the organizations doing this? If you'll send it to me, we'll put it up on Southeast Green. Okay, thank you all so much for your time and attendance. We appreciate it.